Welcome. Welcome to the College of the Atlantic graduation ceremony. I'm Darren, COA's president. And last time I stood in this tent was on my own COA graduation day. Actually, no, it was inauguration, wasn't it? But before that, <laughs> before that it was my own COA graduation day 7,301 days ago. And there's, a, there's an app for that, just in case you know. <laughs> Um, but this is my first opportunity to be a part of this special ceremony as president, and I hope more than anything I find myself giving the COA presidential speech an equal number of thousands of days in the future. But as it's my first talk as, as president, I've spent a lot of time thinking about it. I've asked tons and tons of people, what, what should I say? And I, I've got three rules after all this questioning and, and asking. One, keep it short. The brutal fact is more than likely no one's going to remember what I have to say. Um, but if I drag on and on and on, that'll definitely be remembered. So I'm setting my six-minute time limit with my watch right now. Um, number two, I've been told to eliminate analogies. And I found that, you know, the worst examples of talks like these are full of prophetic kind of hallmark moments involving butterflies and springboards and blossoming flowers, mountain climbing. And I said, God, you know, I, I hope Bob Krolwich doesn't use those in, in his own talk. Um, so I've, I've tried to eliminate most of, the, <laughs> most of them from mine, but no more analogies. And then the third rule is celebrate the students. It's all about you. And this is easy because um, there's so much to celebrate, and this student group is so fantastic. But because of this authenticity that I have of having been a student, I could definitely find myself talking about myself and talking about the past and the good old days back in the late 80s. But that's one reason I have a wife, and my wife Karen is going to steer me clear. If I start to go down that road, she might start scratching violently at her head, and that's the sign for me to get back in the right direction. But Considering the brevity, the concise speech, and the celebratory agenda, I've, I've just two simple things that I wanted to pass it on. Um, first, I look at these 84 students, uh, 80 BA candidates and four master's candidates, 60 women, 24 men, representatives <laughs> from, <laughs> from, <laughs> representatives from 15 countries, Human beings aged 20 to 54, 15 Mainers, uh, and others hailing from 24 different states, although only one from New Jersey, my own home state. Um, all of you, and I've done the calculations here, it's 320 collective person years of time that you've spent at the College of the Atlantic. Number one, all of you are, you're ready. All of you are absolutely ready to take off from 105 Eden Street, whether you're going to Kazakhstan or Cottage Street. You're ready to make something great, really great happen out there. So leave any doubt or anxiety here in the tent. Leave confidently because you've earned it. You've participated in a radical experiment of higher education, and it works. And some of you saw the 17 senior project presentations yesterday. Um, that was a, a representative sample of seniors. Talk to anyone who saw those presentations and they'd agree confidently. You guys are ready. I added that piece yesterday because I was really blown away by the presentations. But your readiness didn't just, it didn't just happen. It was built by peers, it was built by the COA staff, yes, but most especially, it was built by an absolutely stellar faculty. Uh, by a group of three dozen or so extraordinarily brilliant and inspiring men and women who have dedicated their lives to this institution so that you will succeed. And I know we're a community of scholars and we don't buy into this sage on the stage mentality, uh, but now as graduates you should recognize their wisdom and recognize what they've done for you. So. Um, but your readiness is also empirically tested with alumni. Now, in this first year, I've spent days and days and days 
talking with a large representative sample of 1,838 degree holders in, uh, that have a BA or an MA in human ecology. I've done this all over the country, and they have gone through this same experiment and are doing mind-bending feats of human ecology. So just like them, you're prepared. Second, I want you to be prepared to take risks in a world that might seem like it wants to beat you into submission and narrow your thinking and rip away all your optimism, optimism and idealism. Now you could tell I, I couldn't hold back for, from the analogies there. It was just too, too powerful. Alice Anderson, where's Alice? I can't find her with my eyes. I'm sorry to pick you out right now, but yesterday in describing why she chose to come to COA, she said something along the lines of, COA wouldn't punish or penalize me for my curiosity. And I think, in fact, we, we inspire that. So as you drive off and leave the campus behind, please promise me, promise me you'll continue practicing the risk-taking, curiosity, and adventure that we've cultivated here at COA. Face that threatening world with that risk-taking curiosity and sense of adventure you learned here. And if you ever need a model or a guidepost or an analogy, I just want you to watch the first 10 minutes of Never Cry Wolf. This was one of my favorite movies of all time, and this is my one allowable analogy that I'll conclude with. In the film, there's a young and intrepid wolf biologist named Tyler, who's played by Charles Martin Smith. He's just boarded a small Cessna plane to make this 300-mile journey up into the Arctic wilderness to study wolves. The plane's piloted by Rosie. This is a wild-eyed bush pilot played by Brian Dennehy, uh, who believes that Tyler's up there in search of wealth and not wolves. And so they're coasting along pleasantly in the Cessna, and Rosie says, I'll let you in on a little secret, Tyler. The gold's not in the ground. The gold's not anywhere up here. The real gold is south of 60, sitting in living rooms, stuck face in the boob tube, bored to death. Bored to death, Tyler. At this point, the plane starts to misfire, right? And they're, they're going down, and the engine, Rosie screams. He gets a toolbox. He can't find the tools, and he goes, Aah! and he screams frustrated. And Tyler says, what's wrong? What's wrong? Rosie becomes tranquil. And he looks at Tyler and he said, boredom. Boredom, that's what's wrong. <laughs> and how do you beat boredom, Tyler? Adventure. Adventure, Tyler. And at that point, Rosie climbs out of the compact, uh, brings life back to the propeller by banging a crescent wrench on the engine, and all of a sudden the plane manages to pull up and just steer clear of the peaks and breaks out into one of the most amazing vistas you've ever seen. So you, you get the analogy, right? Yeah, yeah. You get it, right? Yeah. Now, of course, Rosie turns out to be a complete jerk, but if you could somehow bottle that fiery sense of adventure that Rosie has. You put it in a little flask and tie it around your neck. If you could do that, you would make the world a better place. So to review, leave today <laughs> with the qualitative and quantitative understanding that you guys are ready. You guys and women are ready. And second, never be bored. Promise me you'll never be bored and you'll always take Rosie's sense of adventure with you. And of course, you should always know, you always have a home here at the college to return and spin wild yarns of adventure uh, and spend some time with an amazing group of people. So thank you. Thank you very much.